Hello, calculus kids. Welcome back to another lesson in calculus. This is Mr. Bean, and today we're going to be talking about the squeeze theorem. It's also known as uh, the sandwich theorem or pinching theorem, but usually most textbooks will call it a squeeze theorem. Now, it's not actually very difficult to understand what it's doing. It's just a little bit harder to put it into practice. Let me show you how we're starting this off. So you're going to fill in your notes here. If we have some function g, f, and h, what this is saying here is that the function f is in between g and h. Now, it might equal h, it might equal g, but f is going to be in between them. So if we look at the graphs of them, g is always below, h is always up on top, and f is going to be in between. So if you have this type of a situation and you're trying to find some limits, if we say that we're taking, whoops, we're taking the limit of g as x approaches some value, we'll call the value a. What is the limit gonna be? Let's call it l for limit. All right, so that's the lower uh, the graph on the bottom. Now, if we take the graph on top and we approach the same value of a, and its limit is also the same as the, the limit of g, what that means is we can determine that the limit of f as x approaches a is also going to equal l. So let me repeat that. f is in between g and l, or excuse me, g and h. And so if you have the limit of g and the limit of h, they both equal the same limit, then that means the limit that's in between has to be the same thing. Okay, let me show you an example of how this works. So pause if you don't have all that written down because I'm going on. This first one, find the limit as x approaches zero of x squared cosine of one over x squared. Okay, this is just crazy. First, we can't do direct substitution. If you plug in a zero here, you're going to get one over zero and that's undefined, you can't do that. Um, so what in the world do we do? Well, I know that the cosine of something, in this case, the something is one over x squared. So if I ignore this x squared, what do I know about the cosine graph? The cosine of something. Well, the cosine graph is always going to fall in between negative one and positive one. Now, how do I know that? Because it's a sine wave. It's a, it's a sinusoid. It just goes up and down, up and down. It's a cosine graph. So the top of it's a positive one. The bottom of it's a negative one. It's just going to bounce back and forth in between those over and over and over again. Let me get rid of that graph. So uh, that's how I know this. Now, I don't know exactly what this graph looks like, but I don't have to know to use the, the squeeze theorem for this particular problem. Let me show you, though, what the graph looks like. All right. It's this weird, crazy thing. So the next thing I'm going to do is I want to tag on this x squared. So I'm going to tag on an x squared right there by multiplying it by x squared. So if I multiply the middle by x squared, sorry, my pen is giving me problems today, 1 over x squared. So if I multiply the middle by x squared, then that means I have to multiply the other sides of it by x squared as well. So this now becomes negative x squared, and this one becomes positive x squared. And you can see from the graph that if I were to graph the positive x squared, it would look right here like this. You'd have this positive x squared. And then the negative x squared is going to be down here on bottom. Okay, so now that's kind of showing you, it's kind of cool. This is showing you that the graph of this weird cosine of one over x squared is going to be in between these things the whole way through. So now I may not be able to figure out the blue graph, what the limit is, but I can figure out the red ones pretty easy. So I come over here to my two red lines, my negative x squared and my x squared, and I'm going to take their limits. So I take the limit of the first one as x approaches zero. I better write small here, squeeze this in. And then I'm going to take the limit of the middle thing here, the one that I'm actually trying to figure out. And then lastly, I will take the limit as x approaches zero of the other red line, which is just the x squared. Okay, now that I have the limit of all three of these things, I now figure out what the limit of those two red lines are. Well, I know the limit as x approaches zero of negative x squared, that's just direct substitution. So that's gonna be a zero. And that's going to be less than or equal to this, I don't know. So I'm just gonna leave it alone. So I write my limit statement there, and then I know this one, I can do direct substitution. I know that one is zero. So what I have here is the limits of the lower and upper graphs, the two red lines, and I can say for sure 
I know that this thing is squished in between them. It's pinched or squeezed in between them. That's why we call it the squeeze theorem or the pinching theorem. So now we can say uh, with this sandwiched in there, it this must equal those two. So this is the proof of it that I can now say my answer is just zero. So now let's practice some problems that you're much more likely to see on an AP exam, these types of things. This is how they'll usually use a squeeze theorem. They'll, they might give you a few functions. In this case, we're given G and H. And it's telling us that uh, G is going to be smaller than F, which is smaller than H. Now notice they don't even give us F. There's no function F up here, but they're telling us find the limit of F as X approaches two. Well, we don't know what the limit is. If we don't actually even know what the function is, there's just no way to find it out. But if we know what G is, let's just find the limit. So uh, let's see the limit. As x approaches 2, this should just be direct substitution. So it's going to be negative 2 squared is 4. And then plug in the 2 here, you get another plus 4 minus 3. So this limit, that becomes negative 3. Okay, so that's the limit of g. So we've done g. Now let's do uh, h. I'll do h in red just to visually make it a little different. So we plug in a 2. We get 2 times, plug in the 2 here, 2 plus 1, 4 plus 1 is 5. Okay, so the limit of g as x approaches 2 is negative 3. The limit of h as x approaches 2 is 5. What that tells us is that the limit as x approaches 2 of f has to be somewhere in between negative 3 and 5. That's all we know. So we actually cannot figure out what the limit is exactly because we don't know where it falls in there. There's so many, there's infinite numbers between negative three and five that you could choose from. So what we're gonna say for this problem is something like, in fact, I'll type this to make it faster. There, something like this, the limit cannot be determined. That's, uh, or you know, you just can't figure it out for sure. Based on the squeeze theorem, there's not enough information here. So that's how, what we have to end up with basically. Okay, number three, you're gonna try number three on your own, but before you do, I wanna point this out here. It has this, uh, notation from negative 1 to 5. When we're talking about from negative 1 to 5 right there, all we're saying is that that's when this statement holds true, when g is less than f, which is less than h. Okay, this negative 1 to 5 doesn't come into play when any of our calculations. You don't have to worry about it. It's just helping us understand when this g is smaller than f, which is smaller than h, just on that interval. Okay, so go ahead and try this one on your own, just like we did number 2. Uh, pause the video, and then I'll have the answer appear here in just a second. Okay, so I show here that the limit of the function g, which is on bottom, is 3, and the limit of the function h, which is the graph on top, is also 3. So that means by the squeeze theorem, the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x, it also has to equal 3 because it's being squeezed right in between the two of them. All right, so that's how that squeeze theorem can work for this. And our last set of problems here. We've got going on three different functions, f, g, and h. And what we're trying to do is figure out, can we use the squeeze theorem? So does the squeeze theorem allow us to find the limit as x approaches zero for each one of these? So what you have to do then is we're going to do the limit of the lower graph, the graph that's underneath f of x. So as we approach zero, that's just still gonna be negative one half. And then we say less than or equal to, and now we're doing the limit. So I'm going to write the limit as x approaches zero of the function f of x, and then less than or equal to, and now we take the limit of this one as x approaches zero, and that is just one half. So what we're trying to state here is whether or not we can use the inequality to use the squeeze theorem. Can we use the squeeze theorem for this example? The answer to this is no, we can't. The squeeze theorem doesn't help us figure out the limit of f of x because negative one half and one half are not the same number. It's not squeezed in between them. So d don't get confused with the, the idea that the limit of this doesn't exist. It still might exist. All we're saying is that the squeeze theorem for this example doesn't work for us to help us know what the limit is. Okay, so let's go on to this next one. So we're gonna try and figure out what is the limit of this. So we are going to say the limit of the, the lower graph, this negative x cubed, as x approaches zero is just zero less than or equal to, and now we write out the limit as x approaches zero of g of x, and then less than or equal to, and then the limit of this upper function here is just zero. So now for this one, the limit as x approaches zero of g of x is squeezed in between zero and zero. So 
that means yes, we can use the squeeze theorem because since they're the same number. Okay, so this is how you show your reasoning, and then this is your answer. This is kind of like your justification step right here. All right, last one. And that is we're going to take the limit of this one as x approaches 0. So that is just uh, 1 minus 0 is 1. And then less than or equal to, and then I'm going to write the limit as x approaches 0 of h of x. Because again, I'm taking the limit of each of these three things as x approaches 0. And then the limit of this one is going to also be 1. So yes, the limit as x approaches 0 of h of x is squeezed in between the number 1 and the number 1, which is the same thing. So yes, we can use the squeeze theorem. All right, so that's how you show your work on this and give you yourself an answer. Now, before I end this lesson, let me give you one more quick little thing. If these boundary functions that you're squeezing in between, if those things are a function that is unbounded, and when I mean unbounded, this would be an example of that, 1 over x. Because what's the graph of this doing as x approaches 0? This is creates a vertical asymptote straight up and down here, uh, and the graph looks something like that. So if you approach either from the left side or the right side of zero, you would have unbounded behavior where it's going all the way down to negative infinity or all the way up to infinity. So if one of these is unbounded, you cannot use the squeeze theorem. Okay, so unbounded behavior basically disqualifies the squeeze theorem from being able to apply it. So just be careful about that. You might see that in the practice or even on a mastery check that you understand what's going on here with unbounded behavior. It can't be used. Okay, so that's everything. We've covered it all for squeeze theorem. So rock that mastery check and I'll see you back in the next one.